Pause if you mark the podcast show. 16.32 Chapter 5 The Hindigo did not stay in the carriage for long. Two minutes perhaps, Rebecca was not certain. Several of his men came up the carriage. There was a rapid exchange of words. Rebecca did not understand much of it, partly because of the accident, but partly because he was using terms unfamiliar to her. Odd that, Rebecca had been born and raised in London. She had thought herself familiar with every favour of the English language, but yet she understood the gist of they got their decision, discussion. That too, she found peculiar. The Hindigo and his men seemed puzzled as they were disorientated by the location. They were also confused, apparently, as to what course of action to pursue. Strange, strange, strange. Again, fear began to creep into Rebecca's heart. The Hindigo men, for all their clarity, for all they, that they clearly respected him, and sought leadership, they were not addressing him as a nobleman. I meant, despite his cursive manner, he may be, he may must be a leader of mercenaries, a bastard son of some petty baron, perhaps from one of England's provinces. That would explain the accent. Rebecca sank back in her seat. Mercies were vicious. Everyone knew it. Criminals in all but name, especially here in Roman, Roman Holy Roman Emperor, which had given over to the flames of war. Her eyes flittered to her father. There was no comfort to be found there. Her father was fighting for his life. A Moorish physician was holding him up and giving him some small tablets from a vowel he'd taken out of his box. Rebecca did not think of protesting the treatment. The black doctor exuded an aura of confidence and certainty. Indigo came back to the carriage to timidly. Rebecca turned her head towards him. Relieved, there was still nothing in his eyes but friendliness. That, and she found herself swallowing. She recognised her look. He she's seen it before. In Amsterdam, for some of the more constant young people in the Jewish quarter, admiration, appraisal, desire, even veiled under courtesy. But for a moment she decided there was no trace of that of lust. At least she thought not. Lust was not something Rebecca was very familiar with, except the flurry version in which she found some of her father's books and romances she tucked in some great tomes of theology reading a library in the houses in Amsterdam that her father would not notice her seemingly for interest she felt a flash of pain remember that library she had loved that room loved its quiet loved its repose loved the books lying every wall her father's mind lived in the past and did it be disdainful of the present but one but from one modern device her father did nothing but praise the printing press for that alone he he was didn't didn't he was was not to say God will forgive the Germans their many crimes now here they were in the land of the Germans adrift in a time of war seeking shelter in the eye of the storm or at least they hoped she would never see that library again and for a moment Rebecca Albertly Grieved the loss. Her childhood was gone with it. Her child girlhood too. She's a twenty three years old. Whether she wanted from wanted them or not, the duties of a grown woman have fallen upon her shoulders. She straightened her shoulders, then summoning the determination courage. The motion drew the Hindigo's eyes in admiration, lurking within those blue orbs, brightened. Rebecca didn't know whether the cringe or smile it happened, she smiled, and did not somehow find that unthinking reaction strange. Hindigo spoke. His words came clipped, full of peculiar contractions and idioms. Automatically, Rebecca translated from her own formal English. We have your permission, ma'am. We need to use your carriage. We have some injured people. We must get to proper medical treatment. And quickly, murmured them all, still crouched on the floor to his father. I'll give him some aspirin. Rebecca had not understood the, the word. 
indigo eyes moved to the clutch of the chest. The crates piled on the other side of the carriage interior. We have to remove those to make room. For Rebecca started. Her father's box, the silver hidden within. She stared at Indigo. He recognized her fear. She thought to see a flash of anger, but if so, it was gone in an instant. Indigo's large hand tightened on the carriage door. His right hand, she noted idly, one of the knuckles are split, scabbed over with blood. An injury from the battle? But it was, fa- it was his face that she was concerned with. Hindigo looked away for a moment, scanning the distance. His jaw seemed to try to... Then, with a faint sigh, he turned back to her. Listen to me, my lady. Pause. What's your name? Rebecca. She hesitated. Abigail. She held her breath for all the great family names of Shepherd Earl. Arabo was the most famous of Taurus. But the name apparently meant nothing to Indigo. He simply made nodded and said, Ladies, I meet you. Our name is Mike Stern, Strange Mike. Then, oh, is it bizarre contractions again, Michael? Indigo stretched a smile. Then, as quickly as it came, the smile vanished. His face became stern and solemn. Yes, it's a me, Rebecca. I do not know what this place is. Or where we are, but I do not care. For you see, what, what, one damn bit. As far as I'm concerned, we're still in West Virginia. Becker's mind groped for the name. West, what? Indigo did not notice her confusion. His eyes had left her for a moment. Again, he was scanning the c- countryside around him. His fit look was fe- fierce, fierce, growling now, that almost smiling. You, your father? Are under the protection of the people of West Virginia. His eyes moved. His eyes listened to his men. Clustered in belly, they were watching him, listening to him. The Hindigo's jaw tightened. Sincerely, he stated, You are under the protection of the United Mine Workers of America. Rebecca saw the Hindigo's men lift their shoulders, swelling their own determination. Pride, asleep, dedicating. Looking weapons gleamed in the sunlight. Damn we're up the street, barked one of the young men. He cast his own hawk glare at the countryside. Rebecca was hardened by the reaction, but a confusion deepened. America? A heart slank. It's almost no English in America. True, the little Richard Conley of there is is called Virginia. If if it if I remember correctly, but America is Hope fled Spanish, of course, but Spatania they were too. Since the Dutch took Brazil eight years ago, America has been a refuge. My father told me it is even a synagogue in Rinifi. Rebecca stared at the Hindigo. What was he Hindigo? She was completely adrift now. His her mind quote with reason and logic. A confusion must have been apparent. The Hindigo Michael think of him as Michael chuckled Ch- Ch- Rebecca. Rebecca. I'm just as puzzled as you seem to be. A brief moment of humour passed. Sincerity returned to his face. Michael leaned forward, placing both hands on the open windows of the carriage. Where are where are we, Rebecca? What place is this? Her eyes went past his shoulders. She could not see much. They were so wide. I'm not certain, she replied. Taronga, I think father said, we have almost reached our destination. Michael Sparrow's furrowed. Tarana, where is that? Rebecca's understood. Oh, of course. It's not well known. One of the small provinces of the Holy Roman Emperor. The brows are deepened. Germany, she added. His eyes grew wide and then bulged. Germany? Then half choked. Germany? Michael turned his head, staring at the landscape. Rebecca? I lived in Germany. There's nothing like this. Yes, sir. Of course, the, I suppose the country is a bit the same, except for it being so raggedy lurking. He frowned, pointing at the finger of the corpses still lying in the farm. Yeah. These are no men like this in Germany. But, but Michael barked a sudden laugh. God, the professor would round them up in a minute. Germans love their rules and regulations. Another bark laughed. Allies in order and... Rebecca's own brows were frowned. Allies in Oldham? What is he talking about? Germans are the most unruly and undisciplined people in Europe. Everyone knows it. 
This is true, even beyond the war. Now, you started to remember in Mettersburg, that, hun- that horror that had taken place less than a week ago. 30,000 people massacred. Some said it was 40,000. The entire population of the city, except for the young women, taken by Tully's army. Michael's blue eyes were suddenly dark with suspicion. No, not suspicion, surprise. Guess not, huh? You shook out. Sh- guess not. Uh, he sh- t- shook her hand at Madrid later. He <coughs> 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 thought he said, Deal with it later. Right. So now, that, there was a shout. Several. Michael pushed himself away. Herman Carey took him forward towards the woods. Rebecca leaned forward, craving her neck. Many more men were coming out of the woods. <coughs> For now, an instant, Rebecca was paralysed with fear. <coughs> but seeing the odd costumes and weapons, she lacks more of Michael's men, more of them Americans, these Americans. <coughs> then Rebecca saw the first woman coming through the trees, their faces filled with worrying sound. Like a child, she burst into tears. Michael and a woman, safe, we are safe. So Rebecca, the rest of the day and the next and the next and the next passed in the days. She was lost in legends, not even Spadalian had ever dreamed. All she ever remembered were glimpses and flashes. Bizarre vehicles not drawn by anything other than a roar from within. But these were soon enough she understood to be machinery. She was, more, she was more fascinated by the speed of the vehicles, still more by the smoothness of their progress. A carriage travelling at speed would have shaken to pieces. The secret was only partly contained in the credible attraction of the road itself. There had also been, she climbed out of the vehicle, in front of a huge white and beige building, courtesy overseen, concerned for her father. She stooped to examine the vehicle's wheels. Or looking they were. Small, squat, bellied, almost soft-looking. She poked the black sets with her finger, not as soft as she thought. What is this? What is that? She asked her indigo. He was leaning over a smiling. Rather, he called it his tyres. She poked it again higher. Higher. Is it filled with something? Air? The smile remained as it, as it was. The medical eyes seemed to brain. Yes, he replied. Exactly right. There is a uh, pumped into them at high pressure. She nodded and looked back at the tire. It's very shrewd. The axiom, the axiom, air acts as a cushion. She looked back up at him. No. There was no play, just a pair of blue eyes staring at her intensity very wide. Too, as if he's surprised by something. What? she wondered. Into the room now, buried within. Somewhere within the lumber of a huge building. The building was a school. She realised she'd never heard a school so big. The equipment was odd, dazzling. Rebecca realised she was in the presence of people who mastered mechanics and craftsmanship, far more even than the burghers of Amsterdam. But she had no time to wonder. The room was filled with people, urgently moving furniture and equipment aside in order to create a makeshift hospital. A badly injured farmer and his wife were being attended by several women. The doctor was easing her father onto a table covered with linen and removing his clothing. There were rapid exchange of words between him and the woman. Rebecca couldn't follow the conversation. Too many of the words were unknown to her. But she understood the meaning of the woman's head shaking. Whatever the doctor wanted was not available. She drew, he, she drew back his black face and tightened grimly. Despair washed over. She felt the Hindigo's arm go round her shoulder and fingering again. She leaned into the comfort. Tears began, began filling her eyes. The doctor saw her face, came over, shaking his head. I think he has survived, Miss uh, Abigail, uh, said the Hindigo. Rebecca felt a moment surprised that he remembered the name. The doctor nodded. Yes, I think your father will live. But he hesitated, making vague gestures with his hands as if 
groping for something. We had not had the medication that I wanted most. The, again, the strange dream of club, busting, drugs. On my side, he would lose some of his heart capacity, but I sent people in town to get, she recognised the term, victim, beta. The rest, there was a substance that called nature or something. That will help. Hope fled. He will live. I think so. But he'll be incapacitated for some time, days, possibly weeks. And you have to be very careful thereafter. What can I do? whispered Rebecca. For the moment, nothing. Moore turned away and went to the farmer. A moment later, he was back at work, surrounded by assistants. He saw that he was going to suture the man's wound and was deeply impressed by his obvious skill and confidence. He felt anxiety to, to lift. Begin to lift. Whatever could be done for her father would be done. The room was now packed with people. Rebecca realised that she was in the way. On the edge to the door, a moment later, and proof of trusting, she allowed the Hindigo to lead her out of the room. Out of the room, down a corridor, down another corridor, down another, to a library. She stumbled by the number of books. There were many people gathered in the library, talking excitedly, most of them young women, girls, really. Rebecca was made to see how many prostitutes in the library, wearing clothing mo- more immodest than any permitted, even in Antstam's notorious brot- brothel district. She glanced at the hidden girl. Odd. He seemed to have no, no, took no notice of the girl. They were not old prostitutes, realised immediately. That scandalous show about her legs. It be, it's simply their custom. He pondered the fact as Hindigo gently steered her to the couch. I'll be back in a moment, he said. First, I must have to make a gurgle. Cool. In order to arrange you and your father, they, they got the gurgle speaking, working again. He's, eight, he's gone for a few minutes. Rebecca pondered the strange term he used. He recognised the Greek prefix tell. A long call? She wondered. No, distant. Mainly, however, Rebecca spent her time trying to settle her nerves. It's not easy with all the, these youngsters staring at her. They were not impolite, simply curious, but Rebecca was relieved that when they go returned. He sat next to her. It seems to be, it seems to be very, uh, it seems very odd, strange to you, he said. Becca nodded. Who are you? Fumbling around, confu- confused himself. He did go back and explain. He talked for at least two hours. Rebecca came so engrossed in the conversation that she'd been able to ignore her fears of her father. At, by the end, Rebecca was answering far more que- answers than she asked. Questions than she asked. She seemed to accept that the reality in some ways much better than in the go. She prized at first because of the man's obvious intelligence, but eventually she understood he'd done none of the training logic of philosophy. So, you see, she explained, it's not really so impossible. Not at all, the nature of time has always been a mystery. I think Amber Ross was right, she flushed slightly. Well, my father thinks, but I agree. She stopped abruptly. The Hindu was no longer listening to her. Well, not exactly that. He was listening to her, but not the words. Running his eyes, even more of his lips. Blue eyes held silent. Keep talking, he murmured, please. Flushing deeply down, silently flushing. The more he thought to rescue her, he strode in the library and came up to him. If I have a stable, Mrs. Alabama, he said, the best thing to do is get him into bed and make him comfortable. The doctor smiled rudely. Away from this madhouse, he cast a questioning eye at that indigo. Michael nodded. I already sent word into town. Gave Rebecca a glance, then combined with combined Claire a repuzzlement. Under the circumstances, I thought there came interruption. An elderly couple went into the library. They spotted the indigo and approached. Their faces were creased with concern. Michael Roach and Rose introduced them. Mrs. Abigail, Mrs. Morris, and Rudolph, Judith, Judith Ruth. Both, they have been agreed to provide lodgings for you and your father. The rest of the day was a blur. Her father was carried into a large vehicle shaped like a box. The words Marlon County Rescue were embossed on the side. He followed with the Hindu in his own vehicle. The Hindu men had already loaded all the Abigail's possessions at the back of the vehicle in a short time. So fast and smooth, he drew up before a large two-story house. 
father was carried up to the stairs on a stretcher into the house up the stairs went to a bedroom and a more comfortable and made more comfortable. Rebecca and he whispered for a moment a few minutes nothing more than words of affection. Then she fell then he fell asleep. Then the girl left. At some point he murmured something about danger and needing to be watchful. Gave his her shoulder a quick which so he didn't squeak before he went. Departure left her feeling hollow. Everything was rolling around her. Her mind felt the drift. Miss Roth led led her downstairs to the boat saloon and eat her to another couch. Get you some tea, she said. I'll get it, Judith, said, said her husband. You stay with Miss Abigail. Rebecca's eyes roamed round the room. They lingered the stroke bookcase for a moment, for a longer moment, on strange lamps glowing with such a steady light. Everything seemed vague to her. Her eyes moved on to the fireplace, up to the mantel, froze there. Atop the mantel, perched in a plain sight, was a manorock. She groaned her eye, stretched her eyes sideways, staring at Judith Black at the manorock. You are Jewish? she cried, a dazed terror, and if it loots a lifestyle fear erupted in an instant. Tears flooded her eyes, ch- chest and shoulder heaved. A moment later, jo- Joseph was sitting next to her, cradling her like a child. Rebecca sobbed and sobbed, desperately trying to control herself, as she would ask the only question that seemed to matter in the tiny universe, choking on a word, trying to force it through, through terror and hope. Finally, she moaned it. What do- does he know? So I found the question obviously meant nothing to her. Rebecca clutches her throat and quickly squeezed down the swell. Him, the Hindigo. Still frowning, still uncomprehending, un- hope burned terror like a sudden destroys a fog. Oh, Michael, does he, does he know? Her eyes are fixed at the moment. Mr. B- Mrs. Ruff's, Mrs. Ruff's gaze followed. Her own eyes widened. You mean Mike? The old lady said to Rebecca. Stared at Rebecca for a moment. Her jaw slackened surprised. Well, of course he knows. He's like, he's done all his life. That's why he asked us to stand up when he called, when he, he called, when I, he called. He said he thought, he didn't understand why. He just said, it a bad feeling, but we thought it would be the best if this Jewish people. The rest of the words were lost. Rebecca was sobbing in, more fiercely than ever, posing terror first, then a great touching hope, then caressing it and tasting it like a child of braces legends. Indigo trip true and pure, with the morning blue lights again, blue as a cloudless sky and sun drenched day. Days after, Rebecca remembered nothing else. The two days following, simple blue and sunlight. Always sunlight, drenching the sand without shadows.